Welcome back. It's the end of the year and we are looking at the top stories of 2019. In this segment, we are focusing on crime and we have with us Mark Mendelssohn, former Toronto Police homicide detective here with us. Mark, let's start with the manhunt for two. BC teenagers who murdered three people, Brash Migilski and Cam McLeod, led police on a three-week search in the middle of the summer. And it ended when police discovered their bodies in a remote part of northern Manitoba. Where this story is concerned, Mark, we are left with a lot of unanswered questions here. Any speculation on the motive? Why would two teenagers travel thousands of kilometres, kill three people, and then, of course, were found dead later? Well, unfortunately, this was the magic question that we never got an answer to. It was always hoped during the manhunt that when they were found, hopefully alive, that answers would be provided that would, uh, you know, I explain what the motivation what behind all this was, what their state of mind was. And instead, we found that they had entered into a suicide pact amongst each other, and we were left with cell phones and some data, some video that was on there that really didn't answer any questions. And that's the... That's the dilemma we find ourselves in now. We don't know whether this was a thrill kill or we know robbery wasn't a real motive. There wasn't a, it wasn't a matter of money. It wasn't a matter of, of, of a sex crime. Uh, it leaves everybody to, to, to just to wonder what, what went through their minds to do this. And I think, by and large, law enforcement's looking at this as, as, as it was a thrill kill. Um, and whether they had some ideology, um, you know, some, some information or, or thoughts and beliefs that they had garnered from online uh, uh, posts and what have you that led them to this, we'll, we'll never know. Mm. It's all speculation now. Unfortunately, we're never going to get those answers. Let's talk about the course of investigation because this story gripped the nation's imagination, not just here in Canada, but we had international media here as well, making headlines all across the globe where this manhunt was concerned. These two boys were initially uh, known to be missing and then they became suspects. And then the search went on for about three weeks. We saw hundreds of police teams deployed and uh, covering across three provinces, you know, be it uh, uh, from, from BC all the way to Manitoba. What all went into this? Just talk us through. And why did it take so long for conclusion to really come in? Well, I think what we learned and what law enforcement learned was that conducting searches in areas like that, which are, as we've all seen now from, from, the, from the tape that we've seen, most in inhabitable. I mean, mm. this was tundra, this was bog, this was this was uh, an area uh, with 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 bears and other animals, but there was nobody living there and there were roads uh, few and far between. And I think what the police learned was that going over such a vast a vast piece of property as as, as you described, um, even with infrared cameras and helicopters yes. and um, uh, drones and everything else that they used, that it is possible for people to completely disappear and hide their tracks. And teenagers, that too. And teenagers, yeah. It, it, over and above. Over and above else. everything else, yes. And I, and I think that there was a, a tremendous frustration for everybody involved in why is it taking so long. But if you think about the vast land that they had to cover mm. and uh, th the fact that there's no cell service, they couldn't track cell phones, there's no ATMs, they couldn't track cards. Uh, no vehicles. Uh, it was a good learning experience for the police. I think it was an educational experience. What did we take away from it? What, well, what I took away from it is that y you can run and you can hide. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're, if you're careful, and I mean, if they hadn't taken their own lives, we may still be looking for them to this day. And this is, even with the expertise of the Indigenous people that lived up there and the locals who knew the area and knew the trails, even with all of that expertise including the technology, they still couldn't be found till they, till they found a boat in a river by the rapids Right, that had been damaged. That's and right. that was the clue that they needed. I know. And I would suggest had they not mm. found that boat, they may still be looking. Uh, this is one story, like you said, it will have always plenty of questions that will remain unanswered. But let's talk about the other thing that is haunting us, if I may use the word, is the increase in gun violence in major cities across Canada. In fact, there are some uh, figures that show us that they have, they've, they've really been record high in places like Toronto. Uh, what can be done? And this was a part of also the federal election, as we know, a lot of discussion on gun violence. What's your view on this? A lot of discussion, a lot of ideas. Um, I'm afraid not all of them are really doable. Um, this is this this is us. This is Canada growing. I mean, we have gun violence and we have gangs, 
Mm. And gangs have a, a, a mindset and a priority that if you do bad onto one person, there has to be a response. Mm. If there is no response, you are viewed as weak. If you are weak, your gang can be taken over. And the weapon of choice is generally the gun. The bigger yeah. the gun, the better the gun. And we have seen over years now, from the original summer of the gun, even to when I was in homicide, and, and, the, and guns and gangs were expanding. Um, there have been so many suggestions, and not all of them are doable. Okay. Uh, Why do you say that? Which are these which are not doable? Because, yes, everybody seemed to have an opinion on what should be done. Well, there has been conversation that we should ban handguns from the city of Toronto. Um, and that may be a very utopic position to take. But gangbangers and people who are involved in these types of crimes don't really care about judicial and, and mm. city boundaries. And you can ban them in Toronto, but you can't ban them in Peel, and you can't ban them in New York. They don't care where the border lies. They care where their business lies. And their business is driven by money. And it's all about money. So then the next suggestions were made about the bail system. Mm. And that there are a lot of people who are involved in these crimes who are out on bail. They have weapons prohibitions on them already from previous convictions. And it, what you're asking the courts to do is to strengthen the bail systems to keep all these people in. Mm. When you try and do that, you're asking justices of the peace and judges to ignore case law, to ignore law that's already in the books and okay. precedents that are being set. Which, gonna, which is going to turn all of these arrests into huge litigation matters, which will take years to absorb. Sorry for interrupting you there, Mark, but I have very little time left. But can you tell us then what can be done to bring the spike in numbers down, to combat a bit of it? What can be done? It's everybody getting involved. This lays on everybody's lap. It lays on your lap and my lap. But it starts at the border where these guns are coming in. More investigative funding put into Canada Border Services, more communication between the RCMP, the OPP, Toronto Police and Border Services, okay. more investigations. Stop the guns first. You can you can look for the longer sentences later on, but these, these investigations take a long time. They're very expensive, and we're not going to solve it in one year, and we're not going to certainly solve it in overnight. Well, one hope we solve it. Okay, let's... I hope so. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about the other big story, and we'll do this briefly, about uh, the murder of the billionaire couple. We're talking about Barry and Honey Sherman. Where does this case go? I mean, will we ever get answers where the story is concerned? Well, we're coming up to two years now yeah. since, the, uh, since the occurrence took place. Uh, there has been a lengthy police investigation. There's been a $10 million reward put out. As far as I know, that check has not been written. And you get to a point as a homicide investigator where you have interviewed all the people you can interview. You have, you have taken all of the forensic evidence that's available. You have, you have seized all the video surveillance, everything. And you get to a point where there's nothing left to do anymore. Mm. And... You know, we find, we find now that, you know, Toronto Homicide have cut back on the number of investigators that are involved. They've done pretty well, all the search warrants and production orders that can be done. But for a homicide investigator, they may be reaching that pinnacle, okay. which everybody hates, is where you can't do any more, and this may not be solved. All right. We appreciate those insights. Uh, Mark Mendelson, former Toronto Police Homicide Detective, thank you for joining us on the News Channel. My pleasure. Well, those are the three big stories of 2019. With that, time for us to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Stay with us.